And the other project has been this one on Foucault. And Peter mentioned that two books have been published so far. The reason I'm working backwards is mainly because of the availability of the archival material and the publication of Foucault's lecture courses. So these are the two books that are out so far. One is on the last decade of Foucault's life and really is a history of the history of sexuality. The other one is on the immediately preceding period, so the late 1960s through to the mid-1970s. And I'm currently working on the very early Foucault, or the project I'm calling Foucault with Hair, which is <laughs> Foucault and the process of writing the History of Madness. History of Madness was published in 1961, uh, but the process of writing that book takes Foucault many years, and we can link it back to Foucault's early publications on psychology, but also a number of lecture courses that are in the archive and preserved that are going to be published over the next several years on psychology, on phenomenology, on philosophical anthropology. And it's now going to go back as far as 1949, because in the last couple of years they've rediscovered Foucault's diploma thesis, which was on Hegel. Uh, Foucault didn't keep a copy himself, but he did give one to his mother, who kept it. And <laughs> Foucault's nephew found it in his grandmother's house, i.e. Foucault's mother's house. But the Foucault books rarely mention Shakespeare, and the Shakespeare book rarely mentions Foucault. And so over the last few years, I've been giving a series of papers on putting Foucault and Shakespeare into conversation with each other. I've published one that's on political ceremony. I'll say a little tiny bit about that later. Uh, I've written a piece on madness, which is an obvious theme to link Foucault and Shakespeare. And then I wrote a paper last year, which is yet unpublished, which is on contagion in Troilus and Cressida. And last week gave a lecture in London on the question of landscape. And today, I'm going to do another paper that tries to put Foucault and Shakespeare into conversation, which is around this question of the oath. And so I'm going to say a little bit at the beginning about Foucault on the oath. I'm then going to try and broaden out the question and think about what an oath it is, what an oath isn't, how an oath works. And then provide readings of three of Shakespeare's plays, brief readings uh, of Macbeth, of Richard II, and of All's Well That Ends Well. And coincidentally, these are of the three different genres of Shakespeare's writing, at least as they're classified in the first folio. Macbeth is a tragedy, Richard II is a history, and all's well that ends well as a comedy. It's not very funny, and it's got a quite a dark uh, ending, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that question of genre in relation to that play as well. So Foucault's first three courses at the College de France, given in the first three years that he was employed there, were lectures on the world to know Penal Theories and Institutions, and the Punitive Society. Penal Theories and Institutions still isn't available in English translation, although it is scheduled for later this year. Very broadly, those first three courses, Lectures on the World to Know, treats ancient Greece. The second course treats the Middle Ages and the early modern period, and the third, the 18th and 19th century. And all of these courses, I think, can be read as preparatory to Discipline and Punish. And I discuss all of the courses in detail and how they maybe lead to the problematic that Foucault is engaged with around that question of punishment and the wider disciplinary society. But the first two courses also say a lot about the question of the oath, the ordeal, and particularly the birth of what Foucault calls inquiry. Now, in Lectures on the World to Know, Foucault takes an example of a chariot race in Homer's Iliad, in which two contestants had to swear as to what had happened at an incident in the race in which one chariot refused to give way and therefore impeded the other at the turning post. Now, instead of calling the witness, the histor, who had actually been stationed at the post for this very purpose, they decide actually to turn to the two charioteers themselves. And the way of establishing truth in this instance was through swearing an oath in front of the gods. One accuses the other of the foul, of impeding him, of not giving way, and the other denies it. The challenge is issued. Swear by Zeus that you didn't commit a foul. And at this point, the second man cannot accept the challenge, admits the foul, and Foucault says this is important. It means that the oath in which the truth is asserted always arises from a series of rivalries. It's a phase of the agon, one of the phases, phases of struggle. So in this confrontation between two people, if someone accepts the test, they accept the oath with all of the implications that come from this, then they are the victor, but if they refuse, then they're immediately defeated, and the person that challenged them is seen as the victor. So Foucault says that the moment of the oath is an entrance into the world of the gods. You have to swear by the god and that the god will be there to punish you uh, if you don't tell the truth. The decisive oath, he says, uh, does not serve to reveal the truth, we might say, in a straightforward way, but it's to expose the one who swears the oath to a double risk. 
if he committed the crime and swears he had not, then he would be punished for this double offence. But the demonstration of what actually happened is left to the gods, whose vengeance is supposed to make it known. Now, it's important to underline, and Foucault stresses this, that this is for social equals. Where there was a disparity in the social status of the two people in conflict, the social inferior would be subject to an ordeal. Now, one of Foucault's key sources on ancient Greece is uh, Louis Gernet, a distinguished French classicist who looks at the development of Greek legal systems, among other themes. Gernet explains that an oath is essentially a procedure, and that, for me, is an important point in this, in which the individual makes a commitment that the ritual of the oath binds the person who swears. And that, in a sense, sounds quite similar to our modern understanding. But Gernet underscores a second point that I think is also important, something that's rather been lost. Strictly speaking, he says, the horkos, the, the notion of the oath, is something, it's the thing on which you come into contact when you swear an oath. It's not the oath itself. So it could be the object on which, today it would often be a Bible, or the God to which the swearing occurs. So it's a process, a procedure, but it's also the object or the, the um, authority to which you are appealing in that moment. Now, Foucault, in this Lectures on the Will to Know course, argues that later in ancient Greece, and his key source here is Hesiod, that the decisive oath is replaced, he says, or at least begins to be replaced, with the practice of the judgment measure. In the course summary, he summarizes this, the practice of the oath in judicial disputes and the evolution from the challenge oath of, um, of litigants exposing themselves to the god's vengeance it changes into the assertoric oath of the witness who is supposed to assert what is true on the basis of having seen and been present to it. So he says that in ancient Greece, you have something that is like the, the birth of our modern notion of a witness swearing an oath and testifying to the truth. But Foucault notes that this sort of disappeared in Western thought, and then in, as he moves from this course into the course on the Middle Ages, uh, the Penal Theories and Institutions course, he says in that time there's a clash between Germanic legal codes and Roman legal codes, and that it's only at the end of the Germanic Middle Ages that we see a rebirth, what he calls a second birth, of this notion of an inquiry to replace this earlier notion of an oath. So Foucault talks about the way in the German Middle Ages, this is now in the Penal Theories and Institutions course, how you would have these ornate systems of the test, which could be about pronouncing a particular kind of oath and the particular kind of verbal formula of that. Uh, but it, and it may be that if somebody hesitates when they say the oath or they get some of the formula wrong or they don't follow all of the rituals correctly, then that would be enough to disqualify them for them to fail this particular kind of test. But there are also, of course, those famous ordeals. The ones that we use for witches are, of course, the most famous from the Middle Ages. But Foucault talks about ones where you might have to walk across hot coals and then a couple of days later, the blisters on your feet would be examined, and if they were a particular kind, this would mean a judgment from the gods in a particular way. Or it might be that you were thrown into the water with your limbs bound together, and that then whether you sunk or, or, or floated would be the thing that would uh, give the measure of this particular kind of judgment. And again, he sees these trials, these ordeals, as a matter of combat, of deciding who was the stronger, that the trial was nothing more than the ritual-regulated continuation of war theme that Foucault obviously develops elsewhere. So Foucault's stressing with this notion of the test, it could be an oath, it could be an ordeal, the binary aspect. Somebody will win, somebody will lose. It's victory or defeat rather than some kind of balanced judgment. And a crucial point that he makes is that the judge in these procedures is not there to decide what the truth is. The judge is there to make sure that the ritual aspects of this procedure are followed appropriately. They're followed adequately in all of these instances. And he calls this an instance of, of theatre, of political theatre. In the theatre, the judgment is still a struggle, an episode of war, a rivalry. And the notion of the inquiry, which he sees as developing out of the later Middle Ages, is something that for him replaces this earlier notion of the test, the ordeal. Uh, it's something that is crucial to Western knowledge, but is progressively replaced in the 18th, 19th centuries by the notion of the examination. And in Foucault's first three lecture courses, you have this shift from the measure in ancient Greece, the inquiry at the end of the Middle Ages, through to the examination, which he sees as part of the modern way of thinking about it. He thinks about this in such detail in the first three College de France lecture courses, and, but he develops this in most detail in a lecture course he gave in Brazil in 1973, which is known as Truth and Juridical Forms. And there are five lectures in that course that make use of material that he previously delivered in Paris in 
in those Collège de France courses. So drawing on the 1971-72 course, the Penal Theories and Institutions course, Foucault asserts that the inquiry is precisely a political form, a form of management and an exercise of power that through the judicial institution became in Western uh, culture a way of authenticating truth, of acquiring those things that will be regarded as true and transmitting them. The inquiry that replaces for Foucault this earlier notion of the oath and the ordeal is a form of knowledge power. And I think that now in the light of Foucault's lecture courses at the Collège de France, we can turn to many of his publications and we can see single sentences sometimes in those works that in his lectures rested on a much more detailed examination or uh, uh, analysis of particular points. So a long passage here from, from Foucault's Severe Punir, Discipline and Punish. I'm not going to read the whole quote, but there's a passage in the middle of there where he says, the inquiry as an authoritarian search for truth observed or attested was thus opposed to the old procedure of the oath, the ordeal, the judicial duel, the judgment of God, or even the transaction between private individuals. And I think that that single line there in the book is dependent on that much, de much more detailed analysis that he makes in the lecture course. But the oath does not disappear in Western legal thought. For Foucault, it reappears in his work in 1981, when he gives some lectures at the University of Louvain. And those are the lectures that are in French, mal faire de vrai, translated as wrongdoing, truth-telling. Now, while in the early 1970s, when he's doing that preparatory work for Discipline and Punish, Foucault's interested in the discussion of the oath in ancient Greece and in the Middle Ages because of his interest in the shifting nature of judicial practices and this analysis of measure, in inquiry, examination... In 1981, when he talks about these themes, he's interested in how this helps to elucidate the practice of confession, or what he calls sometimes the notion of a vowel. Now, Foucault then, in this 1981 course, makes use of material that he previously delivered in, in Paris 10 years before, but he sets it in this different context. And by 1981, he's working on the history of sexuality. He's writing the book that has just been published in French, the fourth volume of the history of sexuality, The Confessions or the Avowal of the Flesh. And Foucault again turns back to the Iliad and the chariot race, but by this time when Foucault is talking about the notion of an oath being proclaimed, he is framing this within this notion of truth-telling, or what he calls at times veridiction, which is a literal way of thinking about the speaking or saying of truth. Now, to my knowledge, the first time that Giorgio Gambon talks about the notion of the oath comes in his book on St. Paul, The Time That Remains, and what's interesting about that reference is that there, Agamben makes it explicit that he is picking up on a theme that he takes from Foucault's 1981 lectures at the University of Louvain, the, truth, uh, the wrongdoing truth-telling lectures. But Agamben works this through in most detail when he writes the book Sacrament of Language and Archaeology of the Oath, which is part of his Homo Sacca series. It's a book that was first published in 2008. Now, I'm not going to say very much about that book, but I think it's an interesting one in the way that Agamben says that this inquiry into the question of the oath, where he's building on Paolo Prodi's book, The Sacrament of Power, he says, although that book is a historical investigation, it's a book that cannot help but shed light on the present. His point in putting this history of the oath in relation to his own research into linguistics, the history of law and religion, he says, is productive. And when he turns to his own inquiry, he says that the issue here is, above all, the question, what is an oath? What is at stake in it if it defines and calls into question man himself as a political animal? If the oath is the sacrament of political power, what is it in its structure and its history that has made it possible for it to be invested with such a function? And his argument, and he makes this argument that many others have also made, that the oath is something that binds, that ties, that bounds you, that holds together, that keeps united and conserves, it confirms and it guarantees. So he goes on, the oath does not concern the statement as such, but the guarantee of its efficacy. What is in question is not the semiotic or cognitive function of language, but the assurance of its truthfulness and its actualization. And he says all the scholars and sources seem to agree that the oath's primary function in its various forms is the guaranteeing of truth and the efficacy of language. So the oath then is an interesting, intriguing statement. It does two things at the same time. It might make a particular kind of formula that's either an assertion or a promise, but it also acts as its own guarantee. And so it has that twofold function, which is what Agamben and others are stressing. 
And a gamble like Foucault goes back to ancient Greece to examine these questions, although his main source here is Nicola Rowe's work, particularly her book Divided City. And Agamben, following her, stresses that the Greek word horkos for an oath uh, is related to herkos, an enclosure, a barrier, or again, a bond, or something that binds. But he also stresses that the Latin term in question is the sacramentum, which originally meant an oath, and is also obviously a link to the notion of the sacred to the Saka and this Homo Saka series that he's writing. And interestingly, in English, a sacrament in the religious sense originally was a means of pledging allegiance and loyalty to Christ. So there's a whole set of linguistic issues that we might want to think about there. And much more might be done with these texts by Gambon around this. Something also might be done with the work of Jacques Derrida on perjury and lying. And uh, Derrida's seminars on perjury and the pardon are the two next seminars to be published in the sequence of posthumous publications of, of Derrida's seminars, given about 20 years ago in the late 1990s. But I want to go in a different direction today, to go in a more historical direction and a more literary direction, given the theme of this conference. And I was struck by a comment that Keith Thomas makes in his famous book, Religion and the Decline of Magic, where he's talking about the way that the Catholic Church has power in the Middle Ages. And he's talking about the way that the religious sanctions were there in the administration of justice. So it's a, a theme that Foucault and Agamben also talk about, but in, in a, a, a more historical, traditionally historical, let's say, uh, measure. The standard method of inducing a witness to give an honest testimony, he says, was to require him to swear a solemn oath as to the truth of his evidence. The assumption behind this procedure was that perjury would call forth the vengeance of God, certainly in the next world and quite possibly in this one. And this then is, for me, the key point he makes. Hence the slowness of the lay authorities to treat perjury as a civil offence. This was something that could be left to the punishment of God to the religious sphere. And the force of such an oath, he says, might be further enhanced by requiring that it's taken on some sacred object, a Bible or a relic. Now, there's many instances of this in Shakespeare. In Hamlet, for example, there's the demand that Hamlet makes to Horatio and Marcellus not to make known the encounter that they have had on the battlements with the ghost. Hamlet asks them, and now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, give me one poor request. Never make known what you have seen tonight. Now, they immediately reply, my lord, we will not, but this for Hamlet is not sufficient. They are asked to swear it, and they are asked to swear it on his sword. Horatio asks Hamlet, propose the oath, my lord, to which Hamlet says, never to speak of this you have seen, swear by my sword. And Hamlet's repeated insistence is underlined by the ghost, who keeps saying, swear, swear, swear by his sword. And of course, Hamlet himself swears that he will revenge his father's murder. And that famous line that Derrida, of course, and others pick up on, the time is out of joint, O cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. And this explains one kind of oath, a promise to do something, to avenge the murder, or to not speak of the encounter with the ghost. It's a vow to act a certain way in the future, and being true would be indeed to do that act, or not to speak of something. The future action will remain commensurate with the statement made in the present. Another kind of oath is a statement of truth that is backed up by a vow. A statement that something is the case, a promise that the truth is being told, that what has happened in the past equates to the way it is being described in the present. So there's a different temporal relation between these two types of oath. And in both cases, if you invoke a god in this, the suggestion is that they will be struck down if they false, falsely speak about the past or they act falsely in not following that promise into the future. And this is the distinction that we retain in law today between promissory oaths and assertory oaths. I swear I will do something or not do something, or I swear that something is the case. Oaths of undertaking or oaths of witness. For Foucault, these would both be forms of veridiction, of truth-telling. And to my knowledge, it's in the wrongdoing, truth-telling lectures is the only time that Foucault mentions the oath in relation to Shakespeare. He says, uh, above all, the central problem in Shakespeare, or at least in the political plays among Shakespeare's works, it seems to me, is the question of the foundation of sovereign right. How can a sovereign succeed in legitimately exercising power that he has seized through war, revolt, civil war, crime, or violating oaths? It could be interesting, I think, 
to study the entire history of theatre in our societies from the perspective of the question of the representation of law. Now, that's one of those sort of throwaway lines that Foucault says of, you know, he'll be a fascinating project for somebody, and he doesn't do that himself. But I think that others have tried to think about some of these kinds of questions. Foucault does say quite a lot in his lecture courses about political theatre in Shakespeare and the question of ceremony, which is what I tried to work through in the first piece I wrote on Foucault and Shakespeare together, uh, published in the Southern Journal of Philosophy a couple of years ago. I discuss what Foucault says about political ceremony and its relation to theatre, both as theatre, political ceremony as theatre, and political ceremony in theatre, and Foucault's relation about those kinds of questions. But I also try and discuss ceremony in Shakespeare, and I particularly look at the way that ceremonies in Shakespeare are really straightforward. They're nearly always problematic, it seems to me. There's the opening scene of King Lear, where Cordelia doesn't go along with the formal division of the kingdom, and so that ceremony ends in a kind of disruption and all of the problems that then spiral through the rest of the play. In King John, King John is such a weak king that he has to keep being crowned king in order to keep trying to assert his power over the kingdom. In Coriolanus, Coriolanus is supposed to display his wounds in the ritual uh, procedure of a, of a, in the marketplace of the people as part of his being elected as a consul. And because he refuses to go along with this, then this leads to his banishment and the problems that follow. Or in Henry IV, part one, uh, Hal and Falstaff in the tavern are mocking the way that the ceremonial might work in terms of them both pretending to be Henry IV, uh, talking to his son and the, the bad company that he keeps. But in that piece, when I'm talking about ceremony, I don't discuss the question of the oath, which is what I'm going to try and do uh, this evening. The best study of these themes in Shakespeare, at least, that I've found is John Kerrigan's book, Shakespeare's Binding Language, which came out in 2016. And Kerrigan argues in that book that an oath is framed by a formula which gives the language of the speech act something of the firmness of the god or the honor which it is called upon to secure it. The mnemonic ritual context is brought into the utterance. That the form of an oath or vow is given makes it already external enough to be uttered as a thing. And he says of the different words that Shakespeare uses to think about these kinds of questions, of making these promises and binding yourself by them. At the top of the scale of stringency is the oath. It's a word, he says, with Germanic roots that's been part of the English language since the Anglo-Saxon period. During Shakespeare's lifetime, he says, assertory and promissory oaths were typically sworn by God or to one of his creatures. Because they invoke the divine, oaths have an affinity with prayer, and they can imply the sort of conditional self-curse that is often explicit in the Old Testament and also in Greek antiquity. If what I say by heaven, or so if what I say is false, by heaven may X, whatever that X might be, descend upon me. So there's some interesting linguistic issues here around the way that Shakespeare uses these words. Kerrigan here is stressing the Germanic roots of oath. And it's important to note that in English, an oath is etymologically, even if not semantically distinct, from a vow, which comes from French in the 13th century. Kerrigan notes that there's a slight difference between them. We vow not by, but to God, or in Shakespeare's lifetime. And he says the Oxford English Dictionary credits him suggestively, though not plausibly, with initiating this change we might make a vow to another person promising fidelity in love. You actually find in the Book of Common Prayer, which predates Shakespeare's birth, the, the use of the vow in the wedding ceremony within the uh, English Protestant tradition. So this is why Kerrigan says it's not a plausible claim that Shakespeare's the person who initiates this, this change. So this linguistic richness is important for Shakespeare as he's able to do things with the vow words that he couldn't simply do with the oath words. Vow was attractive to Shakespeare, says Kerrigan, because unlike oath, it was lexically well-connected to devotion, to devout, and so on, and it was quick to coin new forms, votary, votaress. While oath is almost always a noun, vow could be a verb. It's close to other words, a vow, and so that notion of Foucault's avowal or confession, uh, and also to words like avouch, avouch and vouch. Um, a vow could mean a solemn asseveration, Vow, he says, is almost an assertory oath, rather as a promissory oath can do the work of a vow. And Kerrigan also notes, I thought this was interesting, that in old um, usage, in, in early modern spelling of the word, when you married somebody, you were betrothed with an O-A-T-H in the middle of the word, rather than, as we say it now, betrothed. So the word has sort of disappeared in that, but the, the oath was part of that important um, ceremony. <clears throat> 
Now, the, the use of swearing to mean cursing or oaths as profanities is linked to these notions. In a sense, it's an oath without an object, a vow without a promise, the taking of a name in vain. When you casually swear or profoundly invoke, says Kerrigan, can rebound on you as an abuse of God and language. Solemn oaths are caught up in a blasphemous counterlife, the surging phatic noise of the collectively profane. Now, in 1606, an, an Act of Parliament in England was passed. It was an act to restrain abuses of players. And it actually creates some textual problems for Shakespeare's plays. Because what it did was it prohibited oaths being spoken on stage. And it mandated a fine of £10 if actors, quoting from this, jestingly or profanely speak or use the holy name of God, or of Christ Jesus, or of the Holy Ghost, or of the Trinity, which are not to be spoken but with fear and reverence. Now, £10 was a lot of money in 1606. It was about the annual earnings of a hired player in the theatre, or it would have been about the fee for a court performance in Shakespeare's time. Now, what this 1606 Act means is that if you have a Shakespeare play that was published in quarto form before 1606, and then also in the folio in 1623, the 1623 text might be edited, censored, in order that it didn't fall foul of this act. So that you can compare texts of a play that was published in these two forms before and after the act, and an oath of, by God, might be replaced in the folio by, by heaven, which was allowed under this act. The problem comes for Shakespeare scholars for the plays that are only in the folio, where we don't have an earlier quarto, because they have to try to work out possibly what Shakespeare might have written rather than what the printers after his death actually put together. But the 1606 year is also important for another reason concerning oaths, because this was the year of the Oath of Allegiance, dating from James I's reign, which built on a previous Oath of Supremacy from Henry VIII's reign in 1535, and from 1559 in Elizabeth's reign. Both of them developed from the 1537, sorry, 1534 Act of Supremacy, which declared Henry the supreme head of the church in England, and the Oath of Succession of that same year, which required the people that swore that to recognise Anne Boleyn as queen, i.e. the second wife of Henry VIII, and also to recognise her children as the legitimate heirs to the throne. And one of Anne Boleyn's children was, of course, Elizabeth, who then becomes queen. So 1559, in Queen Elizabeth's reign, the Oath of Allegiance said, I do utterly testify and declare in my conscience that the Queen's Highness is the only supreme governor of this realm and of all her other Highness's dominions and countries, as well as in all spiritual and ecclesiastical things or causes as temporal, and that no foreign prince, person, prelate, state, or potentate hath or ought to have any jurisdiction power, superiority, preeminence, or authority, ecclesiastical or spiritual, within this realm. Now, the medieval doctrine of the Pope's two swords is important here. This was the idea that the Pope had two types of power signified by a sword. One was the sword of spiritual power, which was the Pope's to use directly. The second was temporal power, which was the Pope's to command, but not to use directly. Spiritual power was limitless. It didn't have any geographical limits to it. It was, uh, in a sense, over every soul in Christendom. And for spiritual matters, the Pope has this superiority over all of those people. It doesn't know any geographical boundaries. The question of temporal power, though, was spatially circumscribed. It would happen within a kingdom, within an empire, within a principality, within a free city. And the idea that comes out in the late Middle Ages is that the king is the emperor in his kingdom... In temporal matters, the king has the same kind of power as the emperor has within the empire, that in these temporal matters, they recognize no superior, but it's within that geographically circumscribed area of their kingdom. Now, this means, of course, that there was a plurality of temporal powers, even if there was only one spiritual power of the pope, the Roman church. Now, I discuss this relation in much more detail in my book, The Birth of Territory, because I suggest there that the notion of temporal power is effectively the forerunner of our modern notion of territorial sovereignty. But what's important in this oath that is there in Elizabeth and is repeated in the ones in James's rule is that what is being asserted by the kings and queens of England is that they have supremacy in both temporal and spiritual matters, that they are removing the power of the pope in spiritual matters within the kingdom. 
1606 has the same kind of formulation about that. I'm going to read the whole passage here. But again, it's this stress on the King of England. James, who is the King of Scotland, becomes the King of England as well. It's that they have that power in these spiritual matters as well as the power that they had always claimed in the crown in these temporal matters. Now, this was a really difficult oath for a Catholic to swear because what it was doing was not simply swearing allegiance to a Protestant king, which was something that people in medieval Europe often had to do. They had to swear allegiance to, to a ruler who had a different belief system to them. But this is explicitly ruling out the power of the Pope in spiritual matters within the kingdom of England and Scotland. And the context for the framing of this oath, the 1606 oath, was that it comes into power very shortly after the gunpowder plot of 1605, which was an attempt by Catholics to blow up the Houses of Parliament when James the King was going to be present in there. And that becomes a context that's important, I think, for some of Shakespeare's plays. Now, in looking at Shakespeare's plays and thinking about this question of the oath, I was really struck by how frequently the word oath appears in Shakespeare's plays. Nearly all of Shakespeare's history plays have discussions of oaths and their breaking. The plays on the, uh, the reign of Henry VI at the beginning of Shakespeare's career have many striking examples. The Earl of Salisbury, for example, says, it is great sin to swear unto a sin, but greater sin to keep a sinful oath. If he's made an oath to the king that he now thinks is sinful, then it will be better to break it rather than to keep to it. In part three of Henry VI plays, Duke of York says that I took an oath that he, i.e. Henry VI, should quietly reign, his son Edward, but for a kingdom any oath may be broken. I would break a thousand oaths to reign one year. Or in a play at the end of Shakespeare's career, Coriolanus, Alphidius accuses Coriolanus of breaking his oath and resolution like a twist of rotten silk. Oaths are crucial in many of Shakespeare's plays. The Merchant of Venice, the important bond in that play, is reinforced by a lot of mentions of oaths and bonds. Uh, the Winter's Tale, Love's Labour's Lost, of promises that have been made and have been broken, and so on. And I was surprised when I was doing the work for this paper to discover there's actually only two Shakespeare plays that do not use the word oath. And it's surprising even more so when I discovered which ones they were. Romeo and Juliet, which has all sorts of discussion about vows and swearing and pledging and so on. And the other one, which I'm going to talk about now, is Macbeth. Now, Macbeth seems an interesting one here because there's a passage in here which is almost always taken to be a very explicit relation to the gunpowder plot and some of the things that followed from the gunpowder plot. This comes in the scene, it's the scene in, in, in Macbeth that is usually the, the most amusing scene, the comedy scene. It's when the porter, who's very drunk, hears a knocking at the gate and he's asking who the person that is knocking at the gate might be. And one of the people, he says, is Faith he is an equivocator who could swear in both the scales against either scale, who committed treason enough for God's sake, yet could not equivocate to heaven. And the idea of equivocating, saying or swearing one thing, but meaning or believing another, was especially important around the time of the gunpowder plot and the role of Catholics within a Protestant kingdom, and specifically the Jesuit father, Henry Garnet who was tried for treason in 1606 because of his supposed involvement in the gunpowder plot. The idea was that he had known about the plot, but he had not alerted the authorities to it. Now, Garnet is interesting because he is almost certainly the author of a text uh, written around 1598 that's called, in its formal title, A Treatise Against Lying and Fraudulent Dissimulation, or sometimes simply known as the Treatise on Equivocation. Now, what Garnet does in this text is to defend a doct doctrine that he calls mental reservation, by which a Roman Catholic who is under interrogation could be permitted to withhold part of a truth which might incriminate them, or to speak in ambiguous terms to the legal authorities, as long as they acknowledge the whole truth in their heart and therefore to God. And what he says is that if you look at propositions that in his terms concern verity and falsity, there are four kinds of propositions, he says, mental, vocal, written, and mixed. Mental forms of these propositions have the priority. Vocal and written are simply ways that that might be expressed so that others can find it. A mixed proposition, he says, could be a whole truth that is held in the mind, 
even if you only speak a part of it. So he gives an example, the sentence, God is not unjust. He says, if you were to say simply the first three words of this, God is not, implying God does not exist, you would clearly be committing a heresy. But if you hold unjust in your mind and believe that, even though you don't say that, then the mixed proposition means that you are keeping to the truth in this point. And this was used by the Jesuits at the time to justify lying to the authorities about things like the location of a Roman Catholic priest who was hiding in a priest hole, perhaps, in a country house. You could fail to tell the whole truth to them, the authorities, the Protestant authorities, as long as you kept the entire truth in your mind and therefore acknowledged it in that way to God. Now, the manuscript of this treatise wasn't published at the time, but it was circulated in manuscript form, and a manuscript was found in the rooms of Francis Tresham, who was one of the gunpowder plot conspirators. And although they weren't sure whether Garnet was actually the author of this text at the time, there was a version of this text that had his handwritten emendations to it. He was clearly somebody who knew the text, who would uh, have distributed it, and it was held that it was an important part of the way that he was going to try and defend himself against this charge of treason in relation to the gunpowder plot. And Garnet was indeed found of committing perjury in his evidence, of using the arguments in this treatise on equivocation to justify in self-defense why he was doing what he was doing. He was sentenced to the standard traitor's death of being hung, drawn, and quartered, but the king commuted the second and third part of that sentence, and so he was simply hung rather than the other parts of that. He was hung in May 1606, almost certainly around the time that Shakespeare was writing Macbeth. And because Garnet was in hiding, because it was illegal even to be a Jesuit in England at that time, Garnet had used many aliases rather than his full name, and one of the aliases he used was Farmer. And in the preceding lines in that Porter scene, there is a reference to a farmer who hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. And so when people put the lines together like this, they say this is clearly a reference to the Garnet case, which had been tried in very public form with pamphlets distributed about what had happened in the case at almost exactly the time that Shakespeare writes this play of Macbeth. There's other references in Macbeth that might relate to this wider context. There's the exchange later between Lady Macduff and her son just before they're murdered on Macbeth's instructions, where a traitor is described as someone who swears and lies i.e. that is somebody who makes but then breaks an oath, and in doing so they prove their oath to be false, and that we are told in that scene such traitors must be hanged. You could also read the exchange between Malcolm, the, uh, the, the son of the murdered king, Duncan, uh, and Macduff when they're meeting in England, where Malcolm is talking about just how bad a ruler he would be as a way of testing Macduff, and the notion of equivocation comes back in there about the idea of speaking falsely and so on. So the idea of oath-making and oath-breaking, of swearing and lying, of equivocation, dissimulation, I think is important in Macbeth in different ways. It's a relatively late play. It can be dated quite precisely because of court performances, uh, and it was a play that was clearly written to appeal to King James, as well as the, the stuff about oaths in the play. There's also, of course, the supernatural, and King James was somebody who had a strong interest in demonology. But this question of the oath in Shakespeare is long-standing. I'm not going to say very much about Richard II. It's one of my favourite uh, plays by Shakespeare. I think it's a wonderfully rich play for thinking about these issues around what we would now call political theology. Uh, Ernst Kantorowicz, of course, uses this play as one of his examples in the books The King's Two Bodies. Uh, many people have thought about different aspects in the play. I'm just going to say a few things about the notion of an oath, but also the notion of a, a judicial duel between two people in, as a means of trying to work out what the truth might be in a situation. The play opens with, you're sort of thrown into the middle of, of an already ongoing dispute. King Richard is the pers first person who speaks a line in the play, and the first non-proper noun that he uses is this word oath. There is a dispute between two noblemen, the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, and the Duke of Hereford, Henry Bolingbroke, and they each accuse each other of high treason. So two people are swearing oaths about the other's action. How do you adjudicate in a situation where two people swear an oath to the truth of something? At this time, you would go to a trial by combat 
as this would be the means of adjudication of working out the truth. So King Richard opening the play, old John of Gaunt, time-honored Lancaster, hast thou according to thy oath and band brought hen hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son. And so this idea of an oath or a, a bond that has already been given by the Duke of Gaunt, um, the, 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 um, sorry, John of Gaunt, uh, the Duke of Lancaster, to bring his son to this judicial duel where he with the Duke of Norfolk would be there to, to mediate on this disputed uh, case. Now, there's a whole set of things that happen in terms of how they might be asked to swear, of how they might be asked to state what their claim of treason against the other might be, and that neither of them will back down, although they're persuaded to do this. Uh, and then it comes to the moment later in the third uh, scene of the play where they are going to have this duel, this trial by combat to adjudicate it, and the king stops it at this point. He throws down his warder, he breaks the duel, and instead of allowing them to, to settle this dispute one way or the other by combat, he exiles both of them. We banish you our territories, he says. Now, the territories part is something I discuss in detail in the Shakespearean Territories book, but here I'm interested in what he does immediately after banishing them. Because he says, ah, well, hang on, I've banished you, so I've broken that bond you have, you are no longer my subjects, but I still need you to sign or swear an oath. So he says, return once again and take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty you owe to God. Our part therein we banish with yourselves. To keep the oath we administer, you never shall so help you truth and God. Embrace each other's love in banishment. And he goes on and talks about all the things that they're not supposed to do when they're exiled from his kingdom. So... He's broken the bonds they have to him as subjects, but he still wants to have the power over them to adjudicate an oath uh, to get them to bind their behavior into the future. They're no longer bound to him as sovereign, but he thinks that he can still act as the person who administers an oath to God to bind that behavior. And the breaking of an oath is a key theme that runs through much of the rest of the play. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through every aspect of the way that this works in the language. But when Richard is uncrowned when he loses the, the, the kingdom and he loses it to Henry Bolingbroke who comes back to take his lands, to take his title but ends up taking the king's land, i.e. England and the title of king and becomes King Henry IV. Bolingbroke comes back and Richard has to relinquish the crown but he goes through a sequence of things that will have to be removed from him in order that he is no longer the king so that he will lose uh, his scepter a symbol. He will lose the rule. He will lose his crown. He will lose the balm that has anointed him as the king. But as he says here, uh, with mine own breath, release all duteous oaths, all pomp and majesty I do forswear. I will lose all the things that I possess as king. All of the, uh, the laws that have been passed under my reign will be lost as well. And then he says, God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke and made to thee. So this idea of releasing all the people that had previously sworn an oath of allegiance to him so that they can in turn swear an oath of allegiance to the new king, Henry IV, is an important one. He pardons the broken oaths, and he talks about all of these other ways that he will lose the things that have made him king in the first place. But while he's resigned to this happening, he knows he no longer has the power to assert his claim to the throne. He does note the crime that is being committed, talking of the heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. He also realizes, as he is no longer king, he will lose his wife as well. Doubly divorced, he says. Bad men, you violate a twofold marriage, twixt my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me, and yet not so, for twas a kiss, for with a kiss, was made. And this idea that marriage between a man and a woman is like the marriage of a king to their kingdom is also like the marriage of Christ to the church. The Book of Common Prayer, this is the, the um, Protestant uh, prayer book that was produced in the Henry VIII reign, dating from 1549, makes this relation very explicit. Matrimony signifies the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. In that text, Husbands are invoked to love their wives even as Christ loved the church. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. And in the text of the Book of Common Prayer when Shakespeare was alive, 
it actually says that men are bound to love their wives. There is a binding, an oath to love at that point on the model of how Christ loved the church, that they become members of one body, of one flesh, and so on. So marriage at this time, and this, this has one example of it, marriage at this time was a very political question because it mirrored that relation of the king or the queen to their kingdom, uh, the, to the country, as well as this religious one of the, the marriage between Christ and the church. Elizabeth described herself as married to the realm that she governed. James represented England as a body of which he was the head, making them one flesh. So this notion of a bond or an oath can run through marriage as well as these religious and political forms. And I think that's particularly the case in All's Well That Ends Well, the last play that I'm going to talk about. As I said, it's generally classed as one of Shakespeare's comedies, uh, which is the way it's classified in the first folio of Shakespeare's texts. But if it was a comedy, it was one of the last that he wrote of that genre. Uh, the Tempest and the Winter's Tale are often looked at as distinct types of plays. Uh, it has a much darker plot to many of Shakespeare's comedies, it's much closer to measure for measure than it is to say much ado about nothing or the comedy of errors. And it's sometimes described as one of Shakespeare's problem plays. Now, because I suspect that most or many people won't know all's well that ends well, I'm just going to give a very brief summary of the plot in the play before I then go on and talk about this question of the oath in the play. So the main character, Helen or Helena, is an orphan. She's the daughter of a well-known physician and she now serves in the service of the widowed Countess of Roussillon. She's in love with the Countess's son, Bertram, and she follows him to the court of the French king. And when she is at the court, she is able to cure the king of a strange affliction. We don't quite know what it is, but it sounds a bit painful. She's made a deal with the king before attempting this, though. If she succeeds, she can have any wish that she wishes fulfilled. If she fails, she'll be put to death. Now, her wish is that she choose a husband. And the husband she chooses, of course, is Bertram. But he's very reluctant to wed her, in part because of her inferior social standing. She's only the daughter of a doctor, he says. But he's forced to do this by the king, who feels bound by the promise he has made in terms of being cured. And so Bertram accepts that he has to marry Helena, but he's not going to consummate the marriage. He runs away and joins the army. Now, Bertram says in a letter a promise. He will only accept her as his wife if she can get a ring from his finger, which I'm never going to take off, he says, and if she becomes pregnant with his child. Now, while he's away with the army in Florence, he desires a young woman called Diana. He makes plans to sleep with her, but unknown to him, Helen has followed him to Florence, and she conspires with Diana and her mother. Diana says, yes, I will sleep with you, Bertram, if you give me your ring. Helen takes Diana's place in bed, she gets the ring, and she becomes pregnant. And when this is revealed, Bertram is forced to accept the promise that he has made before has now been fulfilled, and that Helen has to be his lawful wife. So if you take the play's title uh, simply, all's well that ends well, it's a happy ending. But of course, it's a little bit more dark than this, because Bertram didn't really want any of this to happen. Now, the play has again been read in relation to the 1606 Oath of Allegiance. Andrew Hadfield, in particular, has suggested this enforced marriage that Bertram has to go through with would be seen by the audience as a metaphor for the oath. And there's at least two other things in the play that might mean it's a relation to the particular moment that Shakespeare was writing. There's an early scene where Helen and Bertram's friend Paroles are discussing virginity, and Paroles says there's no way to resist men Man setting down before you will undermine and blow you up. And Helen replies, bless our poor virginity from underminers and blowers up. Is there no military policy how virgins might blow up men? <laughs> now, underminers are sappers. They're military engineers, those that dig beneath the fortifications of a city that's maybe under siege in order that they can plant explosives to bring the walls down. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, this is the first figurative citation for undermine to mean not simply, simply somebody who digs underneath, but somebody who also undermines you in the more colloquial sense we use today. And the gunpowder plot, of course, involved barrels of gunpowder in the basement, in the cellars of the Houses of Parliament, intended for when the king was there. There's also a mention to the notion of treason uh, later on in the play, which may again be uh, a reference to the particular moment 
at which the play was being written. And now there is a complicated debate about when all's well that ends well was actually written, although there is starting to be a tendency to see the play as being written in either late 1605 or early 1606, that very moment of the gunpowder plot and this oath of allegiance. And there's many things in the play that might relate to this question of an oath made and an oath enforced, but it's one that has this question of the notion of marriage and the way that the marriage as a binding promise can be seen as related to this question of the gunpowder plot. Andrew Hadfield, for example, suggests that Shakespeare is able to comment on the problematic marriage between the monarch and the realm, and far more significantly, the uncomfortable situation of individuals in Jacobean England who were forced to negotiate swearing oaths to incompatible authorities who did not necessarily have their own best interests at heart, i.e. to the church, the Protestant church, and to the state with a Protestant king. The result, he says, was a concentration on ways of making promises that did not commit an individual absolutely and which did not actually break oaths and become lies. This is where this question of equivocation and cunning verbal strategies can become widespread. And he says, not restricted to besieged Catholics. And through All's Well That Ends Well, a notion of an oath is really crucial to the play. And the editors of the Arden Third Series edition note that the key words in the play for them are the bonds, the bands, the bondage, and the knots, knots with a K, as in something that is tied, that are central to the plot and the theme alike. At the very beginning of the play, the Countess has realised that Helen is probably in love with her son, and when Helen is interrogated by her, but Helen is trying to avoid the way of saying that she is in love with her son because she thinks it might get her into trouble. She tries all sorts of ways of avoiding speaking the truth, but without outright lying. So she says, well, I ask for my pardon rather than give you an answer. She turns things around. Do you not love him, madame, she says. And the countess replies, my love hath in it a band wherein the world takes note. The band or the bond of blood a mother has with her child. But the other oaths in the plays are things that bind people, that tie them. And Bertram particularly has this bond to Helen, the one imposed by the king, as an undesired restraint on him. And Helen eventually, at the end of this long scene, this interrogation in a sense, says that she confesses, then on my knee before high heaven and you, I confess that I love your son. So this idea that she has to be interrogated, she tries to avoid having to tell the truth, but without explicitly lying, is suggested as a way of thinking about these questions of equivocation of the verbal strategies that might be needed and used in uh, the particular context of the time that the play was being uh, written. And the bond and the band were two different spellings of what was taken to be the same word at the time. Um, Bertram is important here because he trades that bond of language, the one that has, sorry, the bond of marriage that has been imposed upon him, he trades it for the band of brothers in the army. He says to one of his companions, Oh, my parales, they have married me, are to the Tuscan wars and never bed her. He also makes the same choice between war and women pledging his allegiance to great Mars, the god of war. I will be a lover of thy drum, a hater of love. And then he writes a letter to his mother, the countess, uh, where he basically tells her what we as the audience already know at this point. I have sent, sent you a daughter-in-law. She hath recovered the king, i.e. she has cured the king, but she has undone me. I have wedded her, not bedded her, and sworn to make the knot eternal. You shall hear I am run away, Know it before the report come. If there be breadth enough in the world, I will hold a long distance. My duty to you. Now, the knot here is interesting because the knot bedded her, and then the later I have sworn to make this knot eternal. You would hear this as both not the negative, but also not with a K, something that is knotted, something that is tied. So it might imply not simply the not eternal of never bedding her, of never consummating the marriage, but it might also be the not eternal of a marriage bond, but it might also imply the virgin knot, which he is vowing not to break. There's a similar ambiguity later in the play. Diana later tells him that he owes a duty to his wife. Diana's this woman he wants to sleep with. He owes a duty to his wife, and Bertram replies, I prithee do not strive against my vows. Now, clearly, he doesn't here mean his wedding vow, which is, of course, what Diana intends, but rather he's thinking about the promises that he has made to Diana to try and get her into bed and the vow that he has not made 
or he is made not to sleep with Helen, his actual wife. So it becomes quite complicated in terms of who he wants to sleep with and who he's not wanting to sleep with, and the vows and the promises he has made to the different ones at different times. Diana says that she has been warned about men, uh, their promises, enticements, oaths, tokens, and all these engines lust are not the things they go under. One of her speeches when she is speaking to Bertram, Diana says, in response to his claim, how I have sworn, and she replies, "'Tis not the many oaths that make the truth, but the pain single vow that is vowed true. What is not holy that we swear not by, but take the highest to witness. Then pray you tell me, if I should swear by Jove's great attributes, I love you dearly, would you believe my oaths when I did love you ill? This has no holding, to swear by him whom I protest to love, that I will work against him. Therefore your oaths are words and poor conditions, but unsealed, at least in my opinion." And the unsealed nature of this contract implies that it's something that cannot be enforced, it's not being ratified, and this legal aspect to this discussion is important. But it, of course, can go back to the unconsummated marriage between Bertram and Helen. And of the first line of this speech, John Kerrigan, in that book Shakespeare's Binding Language, John Kerrigan suggests, however we take makes in that first line, it must include the notions of constructs or creates, and a line I rather like in this book, you do not have to be a postmodernist to believe that our oaths and vows can figure truth. You might instead be Shakespeare. Now later, in order to fulfill the way that the plot works, Diana tells Bertram she is willing to sleep with him, though of course she's already intending to switch herself with Helen. She first gets the ring from Bertram, the one that he has vowed that he will never take off, because she equates it with her virtue. Mine honours such a ring, my chastity is the jewel of the house. And he says, oh, well, then I'll give you my ring. Of course I will, because I want to sleep with you. And next she plans this assignation between them. When midnight comes, knock at my chamber window. I'll order take my mother and shall not hear. Now I will charge you in the band of truth. When you have conquered my yet maiden bed, remain there but an hour, nor speak to me. My reasons are most strong, and you shall know them when back again this ring shall be delivered. So the band here is again a bond. Bertram exits, he's awaiting the night, and Diana turns to the audience and confides, my mother told him just how he would woo, as if she sat in his heart. She says, all men have the like oaths. All men will make these kind of uh, promises to get you into bed. There's also the knotting that goes on in the subplot of the play, when Paroles, who has a scarf with a knot in it, ends up being tied by that knot, a band of strangers capture him, they bind him and turn this into a very literal sense of something that ties or binds or knots you uh, together. But I want to turn to the final scene of the play, the play, the resolution, in a sense, when Diana asks Bertram, through the king, good my lord, ask him upon his oath if he does not think he had my virginity, had not my virginity, i.e. the oath and the knot as in something that is negative, but also the knot as in something that is tied. And John Kerrigan notes again the play's denouement, and he says denouement is literally an unknotting from the French uh, denoué. It turns on these equivocations that are turned into these charm-like riddles, the riddle of a knot of knots sealed with an oath. And the final key exchange in the play comes when Helen reveals herself she reveals herself to Bertram that she is alive, that she is here, that she has got his ring, and that she is pregnant. And Helen turns to him and says, Oh, my good Lord, when I was like this maid, i.e. Diana, I found you wondrous kind. There is your ring, and look you, here's your letter. This it says, When from my finger you can get this ring, and are by me with child, etc. This is done. Will you be mine now you are doubly one, i.e., the terms of that original vow have now been fulfilled. And Bertram says, if she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I'll love her dearly, ever dearly. So it would appear that the knots of the play are tied up, although the doubly one in this is ambiguous. Does it mean the ring and the pregnancy, the two terms of the condition, or the doubling, i.e. the replacement of Diana to achieve both of those things, or perhaps it means the initial marriage and then this later vow that is between them with its fulfilment. But Bertram, though, clearly is still doubtful. His promise to her is conditional, the if she can make this known to me. 
And yet the king, who doesn't seem to have learned from the earlier problems that he created when he promised a woman uh, a wish that she wanted of a husband that didn't want to marry her, the king turns to Diana and says, again, although conditionally, if thou beest yet a fresh uncropped flower, choose thou thy husband and I'll pay the dower. And in the very last moments of the play, in the epilogue, even the play's title, which people often read as all's well that ends well, the happy ending, even the play's title is revealed to be ambiguous, conditional. All's, all is well ended if this suit be won. Again, that conditional at that moment. Now, the opening lines of Nietzsche's second essay on the genealogy of morality is this question of to breed an animal that can promise, is that not precisely the paradoxical task which nature has set herself with regard to humankind. So if someone makes a promise, how can you ensure that they keep that promise, i.e. that they remain true? Or if they promise to tell the truth, how can you be sure that it is not fiction or an illusion? An oath is a way of binding, either to keep to a promise in the future or to ensure that the account of the past is true. Its importance can certainly be found in the classical and medieval texts that Foucault and Agamben talk about, but it can also be found in our contemporary moment, the oath of office, the pledge of allegiance, the loyalty oath, the witness oath. And it seems to me that Foucault and Shakespeare can help us to think about some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. It was a fascinating talk. I was just wondering if you could locate anything that was um, specifically Shakespearean about the way that Shakespeare dramatises and thinks about the problems associated with oaths. Because obviously, just as an example, I mean, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus is all also about oaths. And I, I wondered if there... And that's, it, it sounds like just a horrible historicist question. It's not meant to be. I just wonder if there's something that you'd see yeah, this is the way that Shakespeare really thinks about um, these particular things. That's a fair question. I mean, it's one of those things that when you start looking for it, you can find it in all sorts of places. And Dr. Faustus is an obvious... Um, the terms of a promise that are made or a, a, an agreement that is made that then gets later enforced. Um, and this happened with the work on territory. People said, you know, couldn't you look at Tamburlaine instead of Shakespeare plays to think about this question? So, yes, you could turn to other dramatists sometimes to open up similar kinds of questions in that particular kind of period. Um, I don't know the Marlowe uh, debates about the, the context of that play well enough to know. I think with Shakespeare, and this is writing later than Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, the particular context in which Shakespeare is making many of these claims, I think, is an important one. Um, the Richard II play is sometimes seen as related to the situation that Elizabeth has with the idea of whether Elizabeth will remain as queen, and then particularly the question of succession that follows her. Or these plays, as I'm trying to read Macbeth and All's Well, that ends well together around this question of the gunpowder plot and the oath of allegiance there. And I think there's something interesting in that particular context of those kinds of plays. But yes, you could certainly read other plays through this lens of the question of the oath. But I think it's this, um, this sort of early modern England and this, this question of the oath that is no longer simply a temporal power oath of allegiance to a king, but it is replacing the spiritual oath that people might have had to the church that forms a particular context that I think that Shakespeare's plays are trying to, to think through in particular ways. And so that's why I'm using Shakespeare particularly to explore those issues. Uh, thanks, Stuart. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I was a little bit surprised by uh, not hearing you. Sorry, is that. It sounds a little bit distorted. Uh, 
Uh, and not here, you're talking about, uh, uh, at all about uh, the connection between the oath and authority. Because it seems to me that uh, there is a very clear connection. There were several references to authority uh, in your talk, but it was never thematized. Now, a couple of points on that. The first is that when we're talking about authority, pre, you know, late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, with people like Max Weber and so on and so forth, having a very specific definition of authority. Authority is that which cannot be uh, contested. So the king, basically, or, or God. And the second point I want to make is that, as is very well known in all the theories of authority, authority is always double, both theological authority and political authority. So within that context, a play like All's Well That Ends Well makes perfect sense. It's a kind of... Uh, uh, it's a comedy because uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, 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 mistaken identity about who the oath is directed to. Uh, and it seems to me that so many of the things that you said play on this double meaning of authority, but you never really underscored authority or thematized authority in any way. Even Nietzsche's quote here is really what is that crazy animal that believes on authority, you know? Uh, so is it, I was still a little bit surprised that you don't, did not thematize authority, not power in the Foucauldian sense, but authority at a very specific kind of concept. Yeah. Part, of, part of the reason for that is I feel I said so much about authority when I was writing The Birth of Territory, um, and that then goes through into the Shakespearean Territories book, um, that I'm not sure that I had anything particularly different to say about that question, and so what I was trying to do today was to do um, a fresh reading, particularly for this con conference, to think about this relation of the truth, and this is why the, the oath became important to me. I mean, the authority question is really interesting, and there's all sorts of different ways in which, in which what we now call authority, or perhaps that broader sense of power, gets thematized in the sort of the late Middle Ages through into the early modern period of which the, the Shakespeare's time would be an example. And so when I was quoting those, um, the oath of allegiance from both Elizabeth's reign and from James's reign, they use all sorts of different words that we would today perhaps think of as synonyms to talk about in these matters, both temporal and spiritual matters, that nobody has any preeminence, priority, supremacy, superiority, and so on. And there's lots and lots of different words that are used notably not the question that we would now say of the notion of sovereignty. Um, and so all of those words which have complicated etymologies and are used at different moments in, in classical texts and taken through into the Middle Ages, I try and unpack some of those questions in the work on territory because so much of this question of territory is what is that power of whatever kind it is? Where does that power apply? Where does the law apply? Where does sovereignty apply? And where does that law or that sovereignty or that authority not apply? And that question of the territorial extent, which of course comes through in Weber's definition of the state as well, that's so much the key question in the previous work that I've done. It I wasn't something I felt I wanted to say something about today. Uh, but it's, it's, it's there, of course, absolutely. And, and that question of who can, who can act as the authority that um, either enforces the ritual performance that makes an oath happen, so... King Richard's example of that even though he's no longer their king because he's banished them, he still feels that he's got that ability to make, the, uh, make these two men swear this oath towards God. Um, or who is, in Foucault's cases, who is the person that has that ritual power as a judge or whatever title to make sure that the ritual procedures are followed appropriately so that this is the, an oath that binds. And that question of who is in the position to make those things, that, that question of who has that power or that authority is obviously important, yeah. Thanks very much, Stuart, for a very rich paper. Um, the question of the promise, the oath, the avowal, is an absolutely central philosophical one. I mean, it's not only Nietzsche who picks up on it, Kant claims that promise-keeping is the fundamental, the founding moral act, as it were. And, of course, promise-keeping becomes central to 20th Century Speech Act 
theory. So it, it, it's a, it's, and it's fundamental then to thinking about speech as performative. So it, but it seems to me that what's central in the discussion of the promise or the oath, going beyond even questions of the particular problems of the oath in Shakespeare's time, is actually the question of speech. Right. That's already indicated in the German the original for, I mean, Versprechen involves, I mean, it brings out, it's not just that it's a speech act, but what's at issue here is the very possibility of speaking. Because almost, one might say that in every act of speaking, there is an unspoken promise, which is that I speak truly to you. And it seems to me that what you're, what you're opening up here is this absolutely fundamental question as to the role, nature, and possibility of speech. I'm learning so much from trying to interrogate these questions, and I think that this is taking me into material that I didn't know so well before. Um, I think Agamben hints at this, but doesn't really develop it in any great detail in terms of what he does in that, that Sacrament of Language book. Um, it's there, and part of the reason why I put up um, the original language for key terms in, in quotes is because it, it can help to make some of those, these claims explicit. Gambon is interested in this idea of the oath and its relation to the question of the political animal. And of course, the, the, the political animal, the zone politicon, is one of the ways that Aristotle defines the human. And the other one, of course, is the one that has and is held and is possessed by language, which is the, the theme that Heidegger tries to work through. So you have those, those twofold definitions of the, the notion of the human is a particular kind of animal. And of course, that's something that Nietzsche, in a sense, is sort of parodying here with this. So speaking is, is very important um, in this. And, and I don't as yet know that philosophical literature about the oath in a tradition that's outside the one that I have some familiarity with to, to be able to work through all of those questions uh, in detail. As Strait, you, you mentioned in your own talk the Donald Davidson line of kind of, it, it's the esoteric is fundamental to any notion of, a speak, of, of speech which I only heard you say you know, three hours ago or something when I was sitting uh, in your audience. And I'm sure if I pushed that line, there would be many more things to say about the way that this works. Um, but it seems to me to be an, an interesting theme in Foucault's early lectures that doesn't get really developed, as far as I've seen in the secondary work, because people are sort of going, including myself, and if, you know, what traces can we see of where Foucault goes with this, rather than what traces can we see of where Foucault might have gone with this had he chosen to take a different path. And it seems that there's something quite interesting in the way that Foucault is playing with these ideas of the oath and the ordeal as pre-modern isn't quite the right word, but, but as a sort of an obsolete system of the way that these things were established that then gets replaced by something else. And I think that one of the things that Shakespeare does in, in many ways is to complicate the idea that there is that kind of break where that gets lost in the late Middle Ages and that we then move into a different period. I think Shakespeare's hinting at something about how important this is continuing into early modern England, this 17th century context that I'm talking about with the Oath of Allegiance and so on. And it helps, I think, perhaps to understand the way that these oaths are still important today in, in particular moments. Um, I could carry on on this, but... but there are other questions, so, but, but thank you. Yeah, that's, I, I need to keep going with this. So we're going to uh, uh, move quickly now uh, and into a coffee break time. Uh -huh. um, but uh, upward in the back, there, yeah. here, and one more. Thank okay. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for your presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, I was really interested in this transition between, in the classical period, um, the, the oath, which I think you were saying moved towards an inquiry, and that was succeeded by... Uh, the examination, yeah. and I'm, uh, my question is about uh, the status of the witness. Uh, I think w my interpretation of what you said is that the, for an oath, uh, the character of the people making the oath is crucial, whether they show that through combat or through ordeal or whatever. Um, does the character of the person bearing witness, does that kind of disappear from the equation? Later well, on. Well, as I, as I read what Foucault is saying, and, and the, sorry, I should preface this by the, there's a problem that Foucault's lectures on the world to know and the Penal Theories and Institutions course, there are no extant tape recordings of those lectures, and all we have for those texts are Foucault's notes that he took into the lecture room. Mm 
with all of the subsequent courses by Foucault, we have recordings of what Foucault said as well as what he wrote and took in there as the preparation materials. And Foucault, like many people that lecture, will have a framework of a lecture, but he won't have maybe every single word written out. And so you have some slightly compressed claims and things in these notes that have been published rather than what he might have said when he was elaborating the point to an audience. So that's a kind of a, it's not always clear what Foucault is suggesting in, in some of these courses that I'm trying to use here. Foucault's point, though, I think, is that the idea of the, the oath of a witness swearing the truth of something they have seen or experienced or themselves have done comes later than this oath about the promise uh, to the, the uh, situation that somebody is claiming. And his suggestion, and he, he's trading very clearly on Louis Gernet's work on this anthropology of Greek law and so on, is that the, the witness oath is something that comes later than that earlier promise oath, like the, the Iliad version that he's talking about of the chariot race. So the witness oath then gets used in different contexts in the Middle Ages, and Foucault's point is at the end of the Middle Ages, that way of somebody who witnessed something and then maybe tr put on trial or, or trial by ordeal in order to, to demonstrate the veracity of that particular claim gets replaced by this notion of the inquiry as a means of getting truth, as this question of knowledge power. So I think Foucault's talking about these different ways in which these get replaced, even though some traces of those earlier forms carry on into the later uh, formulations of it. The question of character, as far as I'm aware, is not something that talk, Foucault talks about, although, of course, clearly the question of the character of a witness and that question of reliability is something that's very important in later sort of legal history about this. But as far as I recall, that's not something that Foucault talks about in this. I was very intrigued by the question of uh, the ritual dimension of the oath, and I felt that disappeared a little bit uh, as you proceeded uh, with the talk. And I am particularly wondering about that in light of, uh, you know, the other model of of promising, maybe, of promise breaking that is in the Nietzschean uh, essay, Nietzsche's essay, and that you also uh, seem to be gesturing toward more than towards actually the capacity to keep promises. So how do you see uh, promise breaking in connection with, um, with the ritual aspects of practices of uh, promising? Uh, like when you were quoting Hatfield, you were talking about ways of making promises that didn't commit one absolutely. Um, but, you know, is there then still a, a, a promise in play that in principle commits one? Or is a promise something that just uh, has this potential for breakability inside it as a, as a part of, as a potentiality in it? Um. I don't know whether I can, can fully address that, but I'll, I'll try and say something to it. Uh, the ritual aspect I did underplay in, in the talk, partly because I said so much less about Richard II than I thought I might. Um, that's a play that's incredibly uh, filled with sort of ritualistic language and the ceremonial and the, the question of political power. And, and I kept that much shorter than I'd originally intended, partly because I wanted to talk about this particular context in terms of the Oath of Allegiance and the gunpowder plot, and that Richard II is a play that was written probably about 10 years before those events. But the, ritualist, ritualist, sorry, the ritualistic aspect of the oath seems to be usually in the, proce the procedure of making the oath. The question of whether that oath is then kept or broken tends, I think, not to have that same ritualistic, ritualistic aspect to it. Now, I'd certainly suggest that a lot of what I'm talking about is oath-breaking in this paper, or at least people trying to get out of oaths that have been made or that they have been enforced. The stuff on equivocation or Bertram's attempt to evade uh, the, the bonds that he has been entered into through the marriage that he did not consent to. Of course, in that play, he gets undone by it because he fi finds out that he has fulfilled all of the promises that he had as additional conditions to that marriage vow. Um, so the, the making and the breaking is something that's really important, but whether the making and the breaking have ritual aspects rather than simply the making of the oath, that I'm less sure about. Um, and it may be in terms of particular kinds of performances of um, procedure. There are ways 
um, some traditions have of, in terms of how you might break an oath like a marriage vow uh, of a particular formula that you might need to say or a particular kind of um, spoken aspect to that which would then break. But again, that in a sense is, is another oath. It's an oath to break the previous oath or something. So uh, you could probably push that. But I'm, I'm interested primarily, I suppose, in the ritual aspects of the making of the oath and then the keeping or the breaking of it is a subsequent thing which may not have those ritual aspects. But it's a good question. I'll think about that. Thank you. Okay, good. We're going to um, more tell the questions we couldn't get to, uh, but Stuart will be around. Uh, I will. Uh, to, to, probably, uh, to get to see and get to know better. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, please uh, grab a coffee on the way to your, the next session. Uh, but, but let's first thank Stuart for an excellent talk. And